the history of these lands. Chandra is going to talk about legislation being proposed for these lands. Ernie's going to talk about some economic impacts of these lands. And Susan J. Brown is going to talk about some of the legal ramifications of these lands. Now, um, and so I. I'm going to start off talking about this checkerboard. How many of you looked at a map of Western Oregon and seen that every other square mile is owned by either the BLM or by mostly private industrial forest land? This is a map of Coos Bay BLM just uh, west of Roseburg, Oregon. And all the orange squares are BLM land, and the white squares is mostly private industrial forest land. And most of Western Oregon, between I-5 and the ocean, and some on the other side of I-5. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> um, this is one square mile, and it's called the checkerboard. And these uh, yellow lands in the checkerboard are mostly O and C lands. You've probably heard the expression O and C, you've probably heard the expression checkerboard, but you might not know how this ever came to be here. Well, it actually started out when Oregon became a state in 1859. And the federal government wanted to distribute land to white settlers to get them to come to the West and, and settle the West. And so they had different land distribution schemes, uh, like for instance, the Homestead Act. And the other one was the railroad land grants. And this one company called the Oregon and California ONC, Oregon and California Railroad, won a big land grant. They won 40, uh, uh, they won four million acres in a 40 mile wide swath between the ocean and the Cascade Mountain Range from Portland to the California border. And the deal was that they had to sell these lands to settlers uh, in order to finance building a railroad. And, um, uh, so uh, the, the deal was they could only sell to sellers, they had to do $2.50 an acre. Uh, but the thing is, both with the homestead, all these land distribution acts were just sort of racked with fraud. You know, the, the railroad companies would go into the saloons and get a bunch of folks to, to, help, to claim land and then they would resell them big chunks to uh, corporate interests. And, um, the uh, Oregonian newspaper in 1904 found that fraud had grown so large that more than 75% of the land sales violated federal law. And so um, between 1904 and 1908 in Oregon, we had some called land fraud trials. They're very famous land fraud trials where over 1,000 people were indicted, including the land surveyors and politicians, and many of these people went to jail. And so after the famous land fraud trials in the early 1900s, the federal government decided that the railroads had breached their deal and they took the land back. It was a little over half the land left unsold. So um, <clears throat> they took back about 2.4 million acres. Um, <clears throat> and so how are they going to manage this? They gave it to the Department of Interior, at where the BLM came along later. And so that's why the BLM Department of Interior, not the Forest Service, owns these checkerboarded lands in Western Oregon. And um, <coughs> uh, so in 1937, um, they decided how to manage these lands. They made the ONC Act, 1937 ONC Act. And this was pretty radical environmental law for its day. This was the time when the uh, industry would cut and run, no replanting, nothing. And so this act, requires that they only log sustainably, and it had other amenities, you know, protecting watersheds, regulating stream flows, and providing for recreational activities. So this was a pretty progressive law for its day. And here is the ONC lands that you now own uh, as they exist today. It's the purple land. You see this checkerboard? So they originally granted it to the railroad companies in a checkerboard format, so it remains checkerboarded today. The green on either side is Forest Service land. Mm -hmm. And you can see the ONC, Oregon California Railroad land, in the middle in the pink. <coughs> um, now, the 1937 Act 
also provided a payment strategy uh, because the county said, well, all this federal land and nobody pays pa taxes. And so the 1937 act said that we will give the counties 50% of the timber revenues from logging these lands. In 1940, 1930, 1940, 50% of the timber revenue was a pretty reasonable amount of money in lieu of taxes. But as time goes on, these lands and these timber became very valuable. The bond between the industry and the county governments became very, very strong. The more they logged, the richer the counties became and the richer industry became. And so uh, the counties became a strong cheerleader for the timber industry. They would get 50% of all revenue in the timber industry would make out pretty good too. Um, because of this nice amount of money, uh, here's an example, 1975 to 1995, $1.7 billion in timber receipts to the counties. No need to raise property taxes here, right? And as a matter of fact, you know, in that checkboard, every other section is owned mostly by corporate interest. Their taxes were slashed, their property taxes were slashed during this time so that now you and I pay much higher property taxes than the industry pays on those lands. Um, so, um, <clears throat> They logged so much uh, that there's not very much old growth was left by 1990. The northern spotted owl was uh, declared endangered in 1990 and uh, the marble millet in 1992. So because they stripped away the homes of these critters, the Endangered Species Act kicked in. And so to compensate for this, in 1994, we got the Northwest Forest Plan. And uh, in 1994, it really put the brakes on this high amount of logging. And they set aside a large amount of the forest. The forest was so damaged, it put a lot of forest in reserves. Unfortunately, all the forests that went into the wildlife reserves in 1994, about 50% of them had been clear cut before they were reserves. But nonetheless, this is what we got in 1995, was the Northwest Forest Plan. And, um, and, and so because the logging slowed down, the counties then were pretty starved for money. So uh, the federal government decided to um, just pay them. And for the first time, the link between logging revenues and the county payments was severed uh, after the Northwest Forest Plan. And uh, there was different schemes. In 2000, they started what was known as the Secure Rural Schools Legislation. And this just paid the counties an amount of money and did tie it to logging revenues. And you can see that uh, here's, what the, here's when it started right here. And it's very similar, better than what they were making under um, when it was tied. Now, uh, after a while, uh, Congress, this is a huge amount of money, and they kind of balked at it. And so in 2008, it was reduced. And it's been reduced every year since then. And right now, they barely get any money at all uh, from Congress. And so what are we going to do about that? Well, everyone has an idea of how to fix that. Ron White says we need to go back and log more and give them a receipt of the funding. Chandra's going to talk more about that. Um, just real quickly here, it's interesting to note that uh, if the federal government were to actually pay what industrial land pays as taxes on their land, if they were to actually pay that to the counties, they would get around $8 million a year, not $28 million a year. So uh, oh, actually uh, $115 million, $110, $115 million, they would actually only be getting about $8 million if they were actually getting what, what private industry paid in taxes. Now, of course, you can't, uh, you have to figure out a reason to, to tie it back to uh, logging, and Ron White tells us it's gridlock. And I just want to point out that under the Northwest Forest Plan, we do not have gridlock. This just came out two months ago. This is the BLM fact sheet, just came out two months ago. And we can see that in the last five years, we average around 214 million board feet a year, just in Western Oregon, just on ONC lands. That's how much timber is being cut. It, it's about a billion board feet over the last five years, that's about a half a million log truck loads. This is not, this is not gridlock. Um, so, uh, 
keep in mind now, with all this other legislation that we're going to go into here, that we're only talking about half the land, 50% of the land. Remember, the other 50% looks like this. This is Weyerhaeuser land. Most of the trees missing here were sent to China. Only on federal land can the trees stay local and our supply our local mills. And of course, only on federal land can we get clean air, clean water, um, carbon sequestration, recreation, and all the other amenities that we need on, on our half of these lands. So I think I'll turn it over now. What did they do with the, with the land that was already bought through fraud? They got to keep it. The Innocent Persons Act. <laughs> they were uh, you see, yeah, big chunks of, I mean, that's how warehouses, that's how Rosemary Forest, but that's how they come, they own every other section, you know. It's a homestead, between the Homestead Act and the Railroad Land Grants. And the School Lands Act. And the School Lands Act. They got to, they got to keep all that land. Well, now you've memorized the history of the ONC lands, right? Yes. Um, so my name is Chandra Lugui. I work for Oregon Wild here in our Eugene office. Um, and as Francis mentioned, I'm going to talk a bit about the proposed legislation in Congress. Um, the first being Congressman DeFazio, Walden, and Schrader's legislation that came out a little over a year ago. And then uh, Senator Wyden's legislation that just was months ago. And I guess to start out, I want to um, point out that this is definitely a summary, <laughs> especially Senator Wyden's bill is uh, pretty complicated to understand. Um, I have some uh, summary information up front on the other side of the screen, as well as a map, um, as simplified a map as we can make, honestly, of the Wyden proposed legislation, and it's still pretty busy. <laughs> so um, I'll have it up on the screen too, but if anyone wants to pour over it, I know some people like maps. Um, so the ONC Trust Conservation and Jobs Act proposed by Congressman DeFazio, which I'll probably just call the DeFazio bill, it's what most of us do, <laughs> even though he's not solely responsible. Um, it applies to uh, 2.6 million acres of Western Oregon public lands, and that's not just ONC lands, but also BLM public domain lands, as well as Forest Service ONC lands. Part of that complicated history, Francis talked about the Forest Service actually ended up with some of the ONC lands. It places about 1.6 million acres of these uh, ONC lands, um, or yeah, the ONC lands, um, up to 125 years old, into a timber trust, which would be managed under a cent uh, under Forest uh, Practices Act that the, that the pilot industry has to follow. And there's specific language that says that that trust has to be managed. Um, to maximize revenue per county. And so I think we all know what maximizing revenue might look like um, for cuts. Um, it transfers all the older forests, over 125 years old, so the oldest forest, I guess, to the Forest Service Command. And it does also designate some wilderness above the Pensino Rivers, and we'll talk about that as well. <coughs> so here's a um, map, kind of washed out actually up there, um, a map of of uh, the checkerboard with um, the red lands being um, those that would go into the timber trust and uh, the green lands being those that, sorry, that's not right. Um, anyway, it does not, not propose, I'm sorry, it says not propose. So yeah, sorry, the green, the green would be transferred to the Forest Service, the red um, would, would be managed as, as this timber trust. And then there's some purple scattered around the edges, and those are Forest Service ONC lands that we're not quite sure uh, what, which direction they would go because um, they haven't really fully really been aged. Um, so anyway, the point being, it's really kind of crazy. It's already a checkerboard, and then when you start dividing up forests that are old, over 125 years and those under, it gets to be kind of a crazy mess, and it would be pretty hard to administer and really fragment um, the landscape even more. Just a couple of numbers on this. Um, the, I think I already mentioned the logging mandates would be a little over 1.6 million acres, as opposed to the conservation uh, lands going to the Forest Service, which we're not totally sure how they would manage necessarily. It would be under the Northwest Forest Plan, so they could be logged. That's about 950,000 acres. So, um, so the I have a little graph showing uh, the guaranteed logging areas up over here. 
guaranteed conservation areas, pretty low, and that's basically just the wilderness and wild and scenic rivers. And then, you know, a mixed bag of, of management, the stuff that's going to the, to the forest service over here. So um, there's not, um, as far as balance goes, um, and as far as conservation and, and logging, it, it's not quite there. Um, I'm going to get into more of the problems with these bills in a minute, um, as side by side, but one of the key problems with the DeFazio bill is, is the fact that this timber trust area, uh, one and a half million acres, would be managed like private land. Um, there's incredibly insufficient stream buffers. Uh, you can apply herbicides all over them, um, and it's essentially just clear-cut logging. Um, and we already have plenty of that. Um, it, would, it would be a real, um, a real loss conservation-wise. Um, Senator Wyden's legislation that just introduced last um, two months ago applies to 2.1 million acres of BLM ONC lands. It's less land than the Fazio's because it doesn't include BLM public domain lands or Forest Service ONC lands. And it would break ONC lands into conservation areas and forest management areas. Um, similar concept of breaking these things up. Uh, it proposes doubling the, exist, uh, the current levels of logging including um, mandating a certain type of clear cutting, which we'll get to in a minute. Reduces stream buffers by about half, um, cuts the public out of, out of um, timber sale planning process. It does designate some conservation areas and wilderness and wild and scenic rivers. Um, and it does protect old growth trees um, and some older stands in ways that the Deposio Mill does not. Um, it, the age cutoff is 120 years in moist forests and 150 years in dry forests. Um, but there's lots of loopholes in the bill as well. I, I mentioned it's complex and there's a lot of language that could be interpreted that logging could be allowed. So another sort of crazy quilt map up here, and this is the one I have in hard copy over there too, um, it, which I, I just realized you just really can't see it in the slide. <laughs> But again, you know, really breaks things up into um, a crazier patchwork. Um, the numbers here, as far as balance goes, are a little bit, a little bit better. You can in interpret. Um, I have the mandated logging over here as being about um, 860,000 acres. Um, the stuff that would definitely be protected, all the older forests, essentially. Um, in the middle here at about 600,000 acres. And then a mixture of, you know, some logging would be allowed depending on, on um, the language in the bill um, over here at 678,000 acres. So, you know, if you add up the mixed bag and the, the guaranteed conservation, you, you get, you get a, a nicer number for conservation. But again, it's, it's a complicated bill and, and there's loopholes and we're not sure that um, this mixed bag management would would not be logged. Um, the logging that's mandated in the timber emphasis areas under Wyden's bill is a, a type of clear cut called variable retention harvest. Um, it leaves about 30% of the sand um, remaining, um, but outside of, of some groups and some isolated trees, it sure looks like a clear cut. Um, this is uh, a, a pilot project um, on Roseburg BLM called Buck Rising um, that was logged last year. Um, this picture up top is a mudslide that happened there last week. Um, it's pretty much like a clear cut with mudslide. <laughs> um, so the 30%, yeah. So the 30% is riparian as well. Yeah, so, um, so there's been some controversy around Around, around this um, and not calling it clear cutting. Center wide really needs to be called clear cutting. <laughs> um, so, to kind of group these bills together and, and their overall threat to our public lands, um, there's a bunch of you know, commonalities. Um, and, and I wanted to point out, you can tell by the maps, that these forests really are in our backyards because they're situated up and down the I 5 corridor essentially, and then a lot more down in southern, southern Oregon. Um, people in rural communities live amongst these lands, and so they're really people's backyards, and they're valuable for lots and lots of different reasons. Um, and and I really feel that that's um, not recognized by you know a lot of folks, except those that live 
live with these floors in their backyard. So something to keep in mind that you know that extra aerial spraying, you know, potentially um, on, on the lands clear cut, you know, could be really affecting people who live nearby and, and their drinking water and um, their quality of life. So, um, so just kind of lump these into a bunch of um, commonalities. So key problems with both bills: weakness federal environmental laws, and Susan Jane's going to talk more about that, but. In general, um, we're seeing weakening of the Endangered Species Act on um, the lands designated for logging in these bills. Um, Senator Wyden's bill in particular really undermines uh, NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act, which allows the public to weigh in on the projects that are planned on our, our land, and, and the agencies have to look at all of the alternatives and um, you know take a hard look at what they're doing, and um, really shortchanges that law. Um, both bills dismantled the Northwest Forest Plan, that compromise that, that allowed us to move out of the timber wars, um, essentially takes these forest, or the timber management areas out of the Northwest Forest Plan, uh, takes the BLM kind of out of the integrated reserve system that was set up under that, the Northwest Forest Plan. <coughs> um, and under Wyden's bill, uh, it also eliminates the survey and manage protocol that a lot of folks have used to, to where wildlife are included um, <coughs> to, to walk in sales. The bills don't protect all the mature and old growth forests that we that we really need for wildlife and you know for carbon storage and for so many other reasons. Um, under DeFazio's bill, there's about 350,000 acres of older forests, 80 to 125 years old, that essentially function or are on their way to functioning as old growth habitat. Um, that, that would be logged. Um, likewise, about 155,000 acres of the Widens Bill. And you know, one of the key provisions of the Northwest Forest Plan was that we would regrow some old growth that we'd already cut down. We lost so much. We realized that um, you know wildlife and all, all sorts of other things needed more old growth in the future. And if we're logging these older stands that are on their way to becoming old growth, we're essentially taking that off the table. We're not growing any more old growth. Uh, over the past decade, under the Northwest Forest Plan, a lot of restoration has happened. Um, a lot of largely non-controversial logging that um, that is, you know, either restoring the forest or there's um, putting money back into restoring watersheds. That's all going to kind of go out the window as conservationists start to start to battle these t these um, these you know really bad clear cutting timber sales and this legislation and uh, all the trust that's been, been built up take a, take a back seat. I think that's really unfortunate. Um, bills threaten wildlife habitat. In the House bill, uh, of course, any, everything going into the timber trust would be essentially eliminated as wildlife habitat. We're looking at clear cuts. Um, under the Senate bill, um, you know, it's not quite as aggressive as logging mandated, but um, it, it really disregards the boundaries set by, under the Endangered Species Act for critical habitat of our threatened species. And a lot of scientists have weighed in um, uh, um, with concerns about, about the impacts of wildlife. Like um, stream, stream, streamside protections. Under Tafasio's bill, um, on the timber trust land, we basically get nothing on streamside buffers. It's essentially like, like private land. Um, uh, well, actually, it's, it's kind of in between. But uh, we lose a lot of streamside buffers. Um, same with the with the Senate bill, so we, get, we lose about half on the timber emphasis areas, um, with the potential for reducing them further. Um, if you if you read through all the complex language, um, it's just an image showing the. Um, sorry, the so watch out. The um, current federal protections for streams um, here in the state and private, and um, if you can't see it at all. It's basically shows that um, the state buffers and the private buffers you know, keep shrinking <laughs> compared to federal. And so that's what we're looking at, is just uh, a shrinking of our street side buffers. The picture um, is, is an example of private land logging on a non fish bearing stream where there's no buffer required at all. Um, and then I also want to mention that this does affect our drinking water. About 2 million Oregonians get drinking water from uh, streams that flow through our ONC lands. And if we're looking at clear cuts of private land, um, a lot of runoff, 
um, dirtier our water and we're looking at more of that on ONC lands is definitely going to affect um, municipalities' ability to filter water and, and provide clean water for our citizens. Another big problem with these bills is that it basically gives away a bunch of our public land. Um, under DeFazio's Timber Trust Bill, those lands are essentially um, public in name only. We don't, we don't, you know, public federal laws don't really apply to basic private land. And it also transfers 34,000 acres um, to tribes. Um, that same thing happens in the Senate Bill. And the Senate Bill also gives the BLM direction to find lands to sell or exchange. And the, the um, language is, um, could be interpreted as a huge land giveaway. And um, others might have more to say about that later, but it could be a real problem. Um, a real unfortunate thing about these bills is that it ties these controversial logging proposals to really great things, like protecting the double staircase wilderness and the wild road wilderness and hundreds of, you know, more than 100 miles of wild and scenic rivers that conservation groups have been working on for years and have widespread support for. Um, they are standalone bills in the House and the Senate. Um, granted, they're not moving because Congress isn't doing anything, but um, tying these really popular proposals and really worthwhile places to protect to, to this stuff is really over the top. Um, maybe the worst thing? I don't know. It, this does not solve the county funding problem. And that's where um, where our congressmen are are saying the, the direction they want to go is well we got to do this because we got to get money to the counties they don't have enough money so Francis talked about the you know the tie of 50 percent of uh, revenues traditionally went to counties and with the drop off and logging of the Northwest Forest Plan that sort of went away we got secure rural schools which pumps a lot of money towards the counties and they didn't change anything the tax structure. Um, the expectation of how they would, might be funded, how much money they might be funded with. Um, but in order to earn enough money for the counties to compensate for secure rural schools money that, that is going away, um, you'd have to log 10 times what, what you are now, and it would be completely unsustainable and illegal, which, which um, these bills kind of make clear. Um, so a comparison of how much uh, logging would occur under these different scenarios, um, under DeFazio's bill, we get up to about 500 million board feet, and over a million, oh, sorry, over a hundred million dollars for counties each year. Under De, under Wyden's bill, it would be less logging, uh, 300 million board feet for 20 years, and would generate um, around 40 million to the counties, as opposed to currently, um, the BLM is logging about um, 185 to 200 million board feet a year, and if um, and they're not, well, they are now, but <laughs> it's just been recently, if those, um, if those logging receipts were tied to county budgets, they'd only be getting about $13 million. Uh, under secure rural schools, the little column way over here with just the money, not the, not the volume, um, they've been getting around 100, 100 million um, from the government. Um, and then, again, a comparison of the Senate bill over here, um, projected logging levels um, between three and 400 million 400 feet. The House bill way up here over 500. Currents down here at uh, around two. And these are just the different types of logging we're looking at. Um, this variable retention harvest under the Senate, slash and burn clear cutting under the House bill, and, and uh, thinning of plantations is what we're doing. Here. So there's big differences here. Where do these bills stand now? Um, the House bill passed out of the National Resources Committee <coughs> last summer. Um, it's packaged with uh, H.R. 1526, a even worse <laughs> uh, Republican bill that, that mandates logging on all federal forest land across the country. Um, and the House, uh, the, sorry, the White House actually threatened to veto it. Um, they, they thought found it was pretty indefensible um, as far as environmental laws go. Um, and it's just kind of kind of waiting now. Uh, the Senate bill uh, had a hearing a couple of weeks ago in Senator Wyden's Energy and Natural Resources Committee, of which he was the chair. He's no longer the chair of that committee, and um, as far as I know, it's not scheduled for a vote in the committee. But as things progress, it could get packaged with other bad national forest logging legislation that's pretty likely. And um, 
if the Senate bill moves through the Senate, it might be um, go to conference committee and, and sort of try to figure out how the House bill and Senate bill would mesh, or it might actually just be packaged with some other Senate bills and the House would just accept it. Um, and I don't really have the timeline and when that's gonna happen, how this is gonna shake out either. Um, as an alternative, we really feel that um, we should stick to the Northwest Forest Plan, build upon it, um, um, separate county funding issues from all of the important conservation issues that we have to deal with on these lands. And um, there's an opportunity to do that through the Bureau of Land Management's plan revisions that uh, they're going through now. Many of you probably you know, was about Whopper a couple of years back, and now they're planning Whopper Jr. And uh, the alternatives, the alternatives aren't necessarily good, but at least it's a way that the public can weigh in and let our let our voice be heard, as, uh, as opposed to the way that Congress is doing things. Um, so I will turn it over to Susan Jane now, I believe. And thanks for holding questions to the end. You might want to write them down because I know it's a lot of stuff. <laughs> of Senator Wyden's bill, this is the ONC Act of 2013. And the reason why I'm gonna focus on that is, um, the, as Conor mentioned, the House bill has already passed out of the House Committee and has been passed um, off the House floor. So it's now over on the Senate side, uh, but the Senate has said that that bill is dead on arrival. So even though the House bill theoretically is a little bit further ahead in sort of the legislative sausage making process, um, it doesn't have as much of a chance of actually becoming law, we think, as the Senate bill does. So I'm gonna focus on um, the Senate bill and some of the provisions there. Um, you probably understood from Chandra's presentation uh, that this bill is very complicated, it's very complex. Um, and there, it, it's, it's 188 pages. So it's super long, there's a lot of stuff in it. Um, it's very um, unclearly written, uh, it's poorly drafted in my opinion. So it's, it's somewhat unclear actually what this bill means and what it's gonna do. But we have a pretty good idea of where our areas of concern are. And this is gonna sound a lot like um, a parade of horribles, and it really kind of is. So um, hopefully you can stick with me for a little bit. I'm gonna focus on uh, our concerns with the bill in terms of the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, and uh, the Northwest Forest Plan. Uh, so in addition to sort of the, the broad overview uh, that Chandra, Chandra gave, um, this is sort of how we think this, this new framework is gonna work. Um, the legislation requires the BLM to develop these vegetation treatments, um, and it commands the BLM to do that. Because it commands the BLM to do that, the agency has no discretionary control over those, uh, the development of those projects, um, because it's mandatory the legislation commands the BLM to do that. Um, ESA Section 7 consultation requirements only apply to actions where the agency, the action agency here, the BLM, retrains uh, discretionary control over that action. Um, so in this case, because BLM doesn't actually have any discretionary control to implement these projects, it's arguable that Section 7 doesn't even apply. Um, now the bill doesn't say that, but if you are a practicing attorney and you're reading these things and you know the ESA, there's sort of a, a, an unsaid code and these are the sorts of things that we're seeing in the bill. Um, the bill does expressly limit Section uh, 7 consultation to whether an action jeopardizes or causes adverse modification only of listed critical habitat only in the long term for the species. Um, and it expressly prohibits consideration of short-term effects. Um, as you know, as practitioners know, under the ESA, you have to consider both short-term and long-term effects on listed species and their habitat, uh, critical habitat. So the bill would, would drastically change that approach. It also overrides uh, the ESA Section 9 regulatory prohibitions on take of uh, northern spotted owls, 
through uh, habitat modification by permitting the felling of nest trees in certain circumstances. So in our typical timber sales that we see today, uh, there's a prohibition, generally speaking, on felling the nest tree where the birds hang out. Um, this legislation would remove that prohibition and would allow for the felling of nest trees in certain circumstances, um, which could, could actually uh, result in direct take. Uh, the bill also does a whole bunch with changing existing timelines and framework for consultation, and it requires consultation to occur um, on these large vegetation treatments on a timeline that overrides the current Fish and Wildlife Service uh, Spotted Owl Survey Protocol. So protocol now currently <coughs> requires uh, two years of six surveys per year in order to determine occupancy or absence of northern spotted owls. But the way that this uh, consultation process will have to occur is on a much shorter truncated timeline. So it won't actually allow for protocol surveys to be conducted. That's, that's a problem. Um, regarding marble marillette, not to be left out of the slaughter, um, the, the Senator's bill replaces the standard consultation procedures with the duty that the BLM mean, uh, merely confer with Fish and Wildlife Service on timber harvest rather than formally consult. Um, so the, con the formal consultation process is typically a much, much more longer, uh, developed, considered approach. Um, here, this simply allows BLM to confer with Fish and Wildlife Service rather than formally uh, consulting with the consulting agency. Um, and, and it does that by vesting the BLM with the sole discretion to determine um, whether treatments in marble marillette habitat would benefit the forest ecosystem, um, thus uh, triggering the reduced consultation requirements. So it's essentially, um, for those of you who remember uh, the joint counterpart regs, which allowed the, the BLM and Forest Service to consult with themselves, essentially, that's what um, this process is. So let me, let me make sure I got that right. It means BLM has to talk to Fish and Wildlife, but then gets to make their own decision. Right. Hey, Fish and Wildlife, what's up? Oh, that's cool. We're going to do what we're going to do. Yeah. Okay, that's <laughs> yeah. Um, so moving along in the consultation process, um, the legislation also uh, replaces the traditional consultation process that we're used to with Section 7 uh, with a new procedure that eliminate, eliminates Fish and Wildlife Services and NIMS' ability to request initiation of consultation. Um, without a requirement, or excuse me, a request from the BLM. So the way that the status quo works is Fish and Wildlife and NIMS can ask the action agencies to initiate consultation. It's like, hey, Fish and Wildlife, Forest Service BLM, we think that you guys are doing something that may affect the species. We'd like you to consult with us. Please consult with us. Um, that requirement, um, or that, that ability for Fish and Wildlife and NIMS to initiate or to ask the agency to initiate consultation has been stripped out in the Senator's bill. Um, the, and, and this sort of is a, is a transition into the NEPA concerns that we have, um, but the, um, the, the legislation also mandates that BLM management activities under the Comprehensive Environmental Impact Statements, which I'm going to talk about in a second, um, continue. So they, they continue in their implementation um, while reinitiated Section 7 consultation is ongoing. And so it doesn't require the BLM to make, uh, it, it doesn't prohibit the BLM to make irreversible or irretrievable commitments of resources. So for those ESA wonks in the room, you know that um, when uh, consultation is reinitiated, action agency's activity has to stop because that um, allowing the action to continue would result in an irreversible and irretrievable commitment of resources while reinitiation is pending. And this legislation um, eliminates that. So if something happens on the 10-year EIS and reinitiation um, of consultation occurs, implementation of the 10-year EIS continues to occur while reinitiation is pending. So it essentially allows bad activities to go forward when in, uh, under the status quo they would have uh, been halted. Um, so there's a lot of concerns with ESA uh, compliance. And these are just some of the uh, things that we've identified um, here, um, and I'll talk about uh, litigation and judicial review uh, in a second. So those are ESA concerns. 
Um, we have huge concerns also with uh, the Senator's bill and the approach that he's taking with the National Environmental Policy Act. And as Chandra mentioned, the legislation uh, limits the NEPA analysis uh, to once every 10 years and essentially prohibits analysis of individual project impacts. So this is gonna be a 10 year, um, the Senator calls it a comprehensive EIS rather than a programmatic EIS, but it'll be a 10 year EIS on timber harvest across um, BLM's holdings. So it's a 10 year EIS. Um, we're not gonna be looking at site specific projects. We're simply gonna be looking at 10 years worth of harvest. Um, there will only be one environmental impact statement um, that looks at the 10 year of harvest and there will be a, a one EIS for uh, dry forest and one for moist. So you've got actually two EISs to look at covering uh, more than a million acres of, of timber harvest. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that we certainly like about our existing NEPA analysis where we look at individual projects um, is, is being able to actually truly identify and quantify and analyze the impacts of site-specific projects and, and that um, will be gone under this legislation. Um, the only reason why the, there's a small out in the legislation that would allow for um, analysis of site-specific projects um, only if there is, quote, clear and convincing evidence regarding significant adverse environmental impacts of the project that were not considered in the comprehensive environmental impact statement. So again, for those lawyers in the room, um, clear and convincing evidence is a pretty high bar to be able to demonstrate. Um, and whatever significant adverse environmental impacts means is probably gonna be within uh, BLM's discretion to determine. So getting the agency to actually look at site-specific project impacts is gonna be extremely difficult under this bill. Oops. And my guess is won't actually happen because um, that's the whole point of the 10-year environmental impact statement. Um, so, when, so how is this gonna work? Well, you're gonna have a 10-year EIS, and then you are gonna have site-specific timber sales that are gonna be um, essentially analyzed in that 10-year um, uh, EIS. And what that is actually gonna translate into um, is a consistency document. So for each individual timber sale, essentially the BLM will have a checklist and the checklist, the consistency document that they have to uh, sign off on, doesn't require any analysis, so there's no environmental review at all, and it only requires the agency to document the names of people contacted about the project, a determination that no extraordinary circumstances exist, and that the individual project is consistent with the 10-year EIS. So it's a pretty short checklist as well, and there's really not a lot on it. The legislation specifically limits the number of alternatives that can be assessed and significantly narrows the scope of analysis that's going to occur in those alternatives. So it's gonna force the agency to only consider alternatives that are consistent uh, with the long list of extremely detailed mandatory uh, management prescriptions. This is sort of the variable um, uh, harvest that, that Chandra was talking about. So the BLM, for example, can't consider an alternative that designates forests in any other way other than what the legislation does or manages them in any other way than what the legislation calls for. So it's definitely a, a very narrow, very significant narrowing of the range of alternatives. The legislation uh, prevents consideration of cumulative impacts in the 10-year EIS. This is, you know, cumulative impacts is one of my favorite claims to bring. Uh, I wouldn't be able to do that anymore. The bill specifically has language in it that um, limits the EIS uh, analysis solely to the effects of the specific action it authorizes in the emphasis areas. Okay, so it's it's only looking at the timber harvest itself. It's not looking at, for example, <coughs> private land harvest around it or anything else that's going on other than specifically what's in the 10-year EIS. Judicial review, this is really horrible. Why don't we just sue? Um, well, it, it'll be interesting. Um, the legislation creates a new limited objection process that reduces the statute of limitations on filing an objection. This is the administrative um, review and judicial review. Typically, we have six years to challenge something in court. Um, that's our six-year uh, statute of limitation under the APA, Administrative Procedure Act. Under this legislation, we'll have 30 days after the final EIS to sue in court. Um, which, you know, we, we do that when we go after TROs and PIs and stuff. Um, but this is a 10-year EIS. There's gonna be a lot of stuff in this. 
and how we are going to be able to really process all that's in it and line up experts and that sort of thing um, is going to um, be very, very difficult for us to do. So um, it, it definitely constrains judicial review in a way that we really haven't seen um, anywhere else. And I have a feeling that the courts aren't going to be very happy with that um, approach either. So finally, the Northwest Forest Plan. Chandra talked a little bit about this as well. Um, as far as I can tell, it, it, it really just pulls the legs out from underneath the Northwest Forest Plan. Uh, reduces riparian buffers substantially depending on what kind of stream you are. Um, you go from some pretty sizable buffers to almost no buffers at all. The legislation appears to eliminate the aquatic conservation strategy and replaces it with a, a less rigorous per, uh, provision that doesn't actually require the protection of aquatic function in time and space. Mm -hmm. So under the ACS, aquatic conservation strategy, the uh, BLM currently has to demonstrate that each project it implements is consistent with nine ACS objectives that are very rigorous in terms of what they um, prohibit. And that those requirements would essentially be eliminated in this bill. Uh, the bill eliminates survey and manage uh, and dismantles the late succession reserve network. And the LSR network was designed to provide for the viability and movement of, <coughs> excuse me, of this spotted owl as well as other species and those requirements <coughs> excuse me that LSR network <coughs> that's <a> cough, <coughs> would essentially be eliminated in the bill one last thing <coughs> that I want to say but I can't <coughs> so I'm gonna turn it over to Ernie <laughs> 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 didn't happen. Uh, there was no real agreement on that. Uh, you can anticipate what the, what the issues were, but I think it's important <coughs> to view what the basic argument is here from an economic perspective. Uh, you hear it from DeFazio, I've heard it exactly from, from White, and, and especially from the industry which basically wrote uh, these bills. And that is, we really get an awful lot of conservation you otherwise wouldn't have. Chandra talked about that some, and uh, you can accept that or not, but you would get an awful lot of conservation that you wouldn't have. You will get uh, a, a lot of jobs in rural timber dependent communities. You would get economic stability in those communities that you don't have now, and you would, of course, uh, get revenues for uh, county uh, public services. And so the question is, that all sounds like a wonderful meal, uh, but is it for free? And I think it's important to begin with some of the basic premises of, of the argument, and that is, what, what's the impact on timber workers? In fact, timber workers would not benefit from this in some very important ways. This is a review of uh, the Wood Products Employment going back to 1947. Uh, the blue line represents a way that the uh, employment was measured uh, until uh, oh, the 1990s. At that point, they changed from measuring employment on a, a, an industry basis to measuring employment on an occupational basis. And so you have to fuss with the number some. Uh, but basically what we see is that since about the 1980s, uh, which is the decade before the Northwest Forest Plan came into effect, we've lost about two thirds of the jobs uh, that we once had in that industry. We lost about 40 to 50,000 jobs. Now one of the things that you'll hear is that we lost those jobs because of the now. Well, the Forest Service looked at the decade of the 90s when you really had the effect of the Northwest Forest Plan and looked at the jobs that were lost in Western Oregon, Western Washington, and, and Northern California and basically concluded that about one third of the jobs that were lost during that decade and just that decade were attributable to the spotted owls. The rest were attributable to business decisions made by the industry itself. <coughs> 
Now it's important to go, to, re, to reflect back and, and to some extent I believe that the history and the politicians involved here are hoping that you all have no memory. Uh, that's one of the reasons to have old guys like me come around because we do have some memory. And one of the things that happened in the 1980s is that the industry busted the unions. This was the Reagan era. Uh, at that point, the uh, lumber and wood products uh, uh, unions were very strong. They were some of the strongest in the country. Uh, the history goes back further to that from the old Wobblies uh, in, the, in the original uh, labor movement of the early part of the 20th century. So they busted the unions and that allowed them to, to get rid of these rid of these jobs. That also allowed them to pay the remaining workers an awful lot less. Before the industry, before the unions were busted, this industry paid its workers on average about a, a 40% premium compared to all workers in the state. So we've gone from the 1980s when the unions were busted till now, uh, uh, we see that the Average wage in that industry is now at or even below the average for the state as a whole, for all workers as a whole. So that's what's happened. Right? It's not the owl, it's other things going on. What's the effect of that? If you just look at the remaining workers, the remaining workers, if they still had unions, and those unions were still able to command a 40% premium, those workers on average would be earning about $17,000 more than they earn today. Statewide, that would be about $425 million going to workers that now goes to uh, the managers and the uh, shareholders of these corporations. Some of it goes to, uh, to consumers. Some of it goes to landowners. It doesn't go to workers. For Douglas County, and Douglas County is really the, the, the center of this movement for uh, let's log more on O and C lands. There are about 3,000 workers there. So Douglas County workers in the industry now are losing about $50 million a year. That's not counting all of those other two-thirds of the workforce that have been eliminated and, and, they, and their jobs that are gone. Those folks are gone. So one of the things that happens if you in introduce more uh, logs into this industry, more public lands into this industry, is that you will have more workers pulled into that industry and the, and the corporations will squeeze them even harder. So that's who starts to pay for uh, the defaults and, wi and widened bills to increase logging on public lands. It also has impacts on family, communities, and other workers. If you have workers earning less, then you know, your community, your family has less resources to work with. But there's another part to this. This industry is among the most unstable of all the industries in the United States. The blue line measures for Oregon uh, the increase or decrease so that the middle of the, of the graph is a zero over there. So it's an annual increase from one year to the next. And you know, employment, you know, it grows and it goes down and it goes up and it goes down. But the blue line is the average, the red line is the timber industry. It's a very unstable industry. You, know, you have unstable uh, prospects for uh, your employment, for your family's income, for the uh, amount of activity, the amount of resources you have in a community, uh, that leads to these sorts of things. The experiment of the Northwest Forest Plan was a tremendous boon for social scientists and that here you had a pretty drastic change in how resources were going to be managed over a very large area. The area is about the size of Indiana. and. There was a, a great expectation. There were these beliefs that timber, we had communities that were timber dependent, and if now you didn't have public timber coming into them, that you know, dependency means you collapse. Uh, you had expectations that there would be all kinds of wreck and ruin in these communities. And in fact, what they reviewed by the National Research Council, panel of the National Research Council, found, looking over that literature, is it was just the opposite. That where you had a higher dependency on timber, you had more social problems. And this sort of brings all of this into the current uh, uh, nature of this debate. With the Obama administration and others starting to talk about income inequality. When you eliminate high paying or upper middle class jobs, about 40, 50,000 of them, when you pay the remaining 25,000 workers a lot less than you ever did before, that and, and you bust the union. Uh, you bust the leading uh, labor organizations in this state, in this region, except for the Boeing folks, uh, then this is what you get. So this looks at what's happened from uh, workers in 1990 
looking out to 2012 and what has happened to them. And it's just what we see across the race for the United States. So this, this notion that the upper 1% is grabbing all of the money, that that's somehow Wall Street and the west of us or the other 99, no, this is within the state of Oregon itself. Who else pays? Well, the economy as a whole pays. You don't hear it quite so much in the last year because you know people have been laughing at them. Uh, but the industry and the and the folks in the in the counties talk about how the timber industry is a special industry. That is to say, it is the industry that is the foundation, or other, or another way they they talk about it is that other industries sit on the shoulders of the timber industry because it is so important to this economy. Well, what we see is that the uh, wood products industry as a percent of gross domestic product within the state has declined from what used to be above 10% uh, is now uh, scraping along at about 1%. And if an industry really is the foundation for this state's economy and it has declined in importance that, that way, you would expect the entire, the entire economy to collapse. And in fact, as the Northwest Forest Plan was being developed, that's what we heard from timber industry economists. We heard that if you did not sell, and this is before the uh, uh, Endangered Species uh, uh, Committee, uh, the God Squad, if you will, we heard the timber industry economists argue that if you did not log 44 sales on timber on BLM land, that half of the economy of the state of Oregon would collapse. It just is not so. And there's no reason to believe that it's going to be so. This chart tracks uh, average stumpage prices, that is to say the average price of logs out in the forest, uh, adjusted for inflation, so they're in $1982, from the 60s until 2011. And it's basically a straight line. You know, you're over there around $100 to $200. There are two periods where you, where you see a deviation from that. One is the late 1970s, and this is a period when we had inflation growing in this, in this country at, at unprecedented le at levels. And the timber industry said, this is a really great deal. Because we've convinced the Forest Service and the BLM to give us three years to log, so why don't we buy the, the timber sale now, wait our three years, inflation's gonna go up and we're gonna make money hand over fist. And they did for a very long time, until you had uh, the Volcker, uh, Volcker, Volcker, Volcker response from the Federal Reserve that squashed inflation. And so, you know, somebody stuck the tin in the balloon and it all collapsed. The second uh, deviation that you see here is the Northwest Forest Plan, and uh, people who were believing that uh, you know, the whole economy would collapse if you did not log on public lands really believed you know, that what they were drinking. And so they expected things to go all to hell. It didn't, and so we're back where we were. There is no reason to believe right now. It could be, you, know, you can't really look around the corner to see what's gonna happen. But right now, there's no reason for us to believe that this industry is going to take off and really be some magical, powerful force in, in Oregon economy. That's in sharp contrast to amenities. Clean water, nice vistas, nice places to hike, and the like. What we find in America is that people increasingly move to where it's a good place to live. And that's an important change, because until about the 1960s, that was not the case. People move to really crummy places because that's where the jobs were. But increasingly we see that this is what happens. And you can see for Oregon, especially Western Oregon, a lot of people move here, and they move here largely for a quality of life. Not everybody, not 100%, but it's a pretty powerful force. Research that was published uh, just this last week, the last couple of weeks, did a survey of the top entrepreneurs, people that had started new businesses or were taken off like gangbusters. And that survey, in part, tried to say, you know, why do you locate where you are? You know, how did you happen to end up you know, wherever you are? And basically what we found out is that people, largely these entrepreneurs are in cities, no surprise there, because most Americans live in cities, most economic activity takes place there, uh, and they are there because of quality of life. Again, not 100%, but really, uh, a dominant influence. They are not there for tax rates. They are not there for concessions made off of public lands. They are not there for anything else. They're there because that's where they wanted to live. Part of that is family, maybe it's church, maybe it's 
uh, ethnic group that they want to live with. A large part of it is natural resource amenities. One of the things that happens is that if you attract people to the state of Oregon, they invest in all sorts of things. And so you have growth or robust economic activity across the economic spectrum. But one place where you do see it is within the outdoor recreation industry. And if you look at existing jobs, right now we have about 25, maybe 30,000 jobs in the timber industry. Within the outdoor recreation industry, we have 140,000 jobs. Of the new jobs, well, the Wyden bill sort of says that it might get about 1,600 new jobs. That's total over the next however many decades. It's not 16,000 each year. That's, well, that's it. The outdoor recreation industry, however, is growing at about 7,000 per year, and that is through the last five years when we had a, we had a major recession. So this is an industry that actually can generate new jobs. The timber industry is not going to generate new jobs. Uh, and, and their history indicates that if they do generate new jobs today, they're going to try to squeeze some of those jobs out tomorrow. Bernie, where does this one come from? A big part? Where does this study come from? Where does this come from? Yeah. Uh, the outdoor recreation industry has a foundation <coughs> or something like that. And they count their numbers. Good question. Yeah, go ahead. Go well, you had 1,600 on your slide, but it's 16,000. 1,600. That's 1,600. it. 1,600. 1,600. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. The DeFazio bill, in contrast, at most would be about 5,000. Okay. I'm sorry for the misspeaking. And the other question I had on that last one was um, I know outdoor recreation jobs. But it sounds like timber industry jobs are coming down to be about equal with outdoor recreation jobs. Um, I did not pay her to, to, to raise that. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, you know, when you get into these debates, and that's the first thing, well, wait a minute, we have timber you know, machine operators who get paid $100,000, and in contrast, everybody that works in uh, the recreation industry makes beds for under a uh, minimum wage. That's just crap. You have people in the outdoor recreation industry that are designing new things. You know, you go out there in the summertime and you stand along Highway 58 or you stand alongside the road up the McKenzie, and what do you see? You see very expensive vehicles going out there. Well, somebody's got to make them. That's what this is all about, okay? And that industry right now, the timber industry, you know, their claim that on average they are, you know, up the top, that's gone. It's gone. Taxpayers. You know, she'd also like you to not remember what happened with taxes when the Northwest Forest Plan was adopted. In this, or at the time that it was adopted, in the, in the early 1990s, you had, actually before it was adopted, uh, you had Washington, Oregon, California, all had a timber harvest tax. Revenues going to support general public services. Oregon, in, or the industry in, in Oregon in 1993 went to the legislature and said, oh, woe is me, woe is me, you've got to get us out of this tax burden so that we can continue to generate all of these wonderful new jobs. And so the legislature initiated a process so they no longer pay a timber harvest tax, except for what they call a timber harvest tax, which is money that goes from the left pocket to the right pocket. It pays for um, uh, enforcement of the Oregon Forest Practices Act. It pays for fighting some fires. It pays for some professors at Oregon State. Uh, it pays for the Oregon Forest Resources Institute, which is the public relations arm for the industry. Okay, those are the purple bars at the bottom. So in fact, you know, yeah, there, there's some timber harvest, but it, harvest tax, but it doesn't pay for any public services. In contrast, the other two bars show what the industry would have paid in a, in a uh, timber harvest tax if it had been under the Washington system, green line, or the California system, red lines. Wow. And by the way, last year, Washington, or California, bumped their tax up. Right? They increased the tax, the timber harvest tax. And you see that it's a pretty sizable chunk of money. Uh, you're up around $40 million. What's important to this also is that the dotted line shows the percentage or the portion of the Washington tax that by a statute goes to counties. So if we had a timber harvest tax that is comparable to the one that Washington has, in 2011, the counties would have received $40 million. So when they say that the only way that counties can get money is by cutting now on public lands, they're hoping that you forget you know, that they reached into your pockets and they took money out of the pockets uh, since 1993. 
and then there's everybody else. One of the things that happened with the DeFazio bill is it's got people to think about what happens if we privatize public lands, and what would the industry pay for? And it turns out that the analysis that they had done says that they would pay about $5,000 an acre. Right? This is a bunch of land, you know, a million acres, 200,000 acres, whatever it's going to be, because they can't log it all at once. Some of them are not going to log for 20, 25 years. So on average, they would pay about $5,000 an acre for it. That is the value of the timber to the industry. In contrast, we have research that's been done that indicates that the harm that the rest of us would, uh, would realize whenever that logging would occur on lands that are important for the production of clean water or the production of water at the right time, what does that mean? It means a big tree is collect an awful lot of water from the fog, the water drops down onto the ground, it goes into the shallow aquifer and, and ends up in the, in the streams in the late summer, or habitat or northern spotted owl, that that loss on those acres would be about $20,000 per acre. Now, not all, all acres have those characteristics, but some of them do. And then this is the killer. This is carbon. Back in the 1990s, when we were talking about all of this, my recollection is, and the people I've talked to, that nobody talked about carbon. But now we are. Research that was published uh, the December 9th, uh, 2012 by researchers at, at Oregon State looked explicitly at the lands within the Northwest Forest Plan and looked explicitly at the lands called the Matrix, which is the lands under the forest plan that are open to logging. And basically what you have is they could compare, let's conserve those lands with what we're doing now under the Northwest Forest Plan or let's convert them to industrial logging where they would be logged every 60 years. The difference between those is a substantial amount of carbon that will be held onto the lands right now, or will be sequestered, will be brought into these lands. And if you look at the damage that, uh, the way economic, economists think about this is, well, what is the damage <coughs> on each additional ton of carbon dioxide that goes into the atmosphere? And that damage uh, it's from a process uh, by about a dozen federal agencies looking at this, Reviewing all of the literature out there is that that damage over the next couple of decades is about 40 to 80 dollars a ton. You add that up across these lands, and the value of the carbon that would be emitted by industrially logging these lands is about $25,000 an acre. But you see, that process that these dozen <coughs> federal agencies uh, use is a pretty conservative process because none of those guys really wants to get whacked on the head by a two by four and they know that to, to Congress this is all very 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 sensitive and if you really look at some of the some of the literature that's out there it says we can expect that maybe that damages maybe about $250 a ton and at that point we are looking at the value of the carbon the value of the carbon is maybe in the order of 20 times greater than the value of the from an economics perspective, we're going to get $5,000 per acre of timber from the Wyden bill. We're going to be giving up about you know, $25,000, maybe $100,000 per acre of carbon damage. And by the way, there's other literature out there that says that this could be an awful lot greater. Part of the, part of the research in the last couple of years says that it's not just that we need to slow down the emissions of carbon, but we need to start taking carbon out of the air. And we start looking at those technologies, you know, it's anybody's guess. But, but in effect, we could be paying you know, a lot more than this. So the, the, the message then again is that we end up paying a very high price for this one. Thank you. Goodness of their hearts, they give 25% of that back to the BLM. 
uh, and basically from the 50s, uh, so that the BLM has an incentive to sell even more timber the next year. But the 50% is 50% of the gross revenue. Such a devastating case. Have you published this, or is this slideshow available online somewhere? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, some of it has been available. Um, not all of it has been available. But we're trying to get there. Mm -hmm. I was a biologist in the BLM, Ecologist, Forest Service, and Park Service. These organizations are vastly stranger than you can imagine. I shared an office with the PhD economist where all the BLM are, are deaf touch each other. And I was there for Dean Bible, the regional head of the BLM, the whole North West Ball. And I heard Michael, let's say his last name, lose it when he said these words. You mean you want me to come up with all the numbers that justify the allowable cut you have in mind? What they're saying is ignoring all data. Do what Reagan and his timber beast told him to do. That's the way those agencies are still run because of one simple fact. The same people are largely there because of the Federal Merit Citizens Protection Board and you cannot fire them. So they're un un untrustworthy in the extreme. So how can we hand over the process? And the last part, it means gutting versus virtually all federal laws that protect us when we go to 